Welcome back to Maximum News. I'm your host as always, Max Danger Derrett. That over there is Saib. I'm still in the US of A. I'm in a different location. So if you hear some background music, I apologize. It's because we're right next to the highway and or we have a cat that likes to bang on the doorway when he wants attention. Uh, anyways, with that out of the way, let's get into the gaming news. Saib, a new Witcher game just got announced. Go. Yeah, so uh, New Witcher Saga, we talked about this on Tuesday. It's not, um, <clears throat> there's no big details. Right, of course. Still it's quite possibly going to gonna focus on the, the uh, I, I believe it's the Academy of the Lynx, or the the, um, the the Lynx something is what it looks like. It's not the, uh, that, the symbol that we saw in the snow, the little token thing, is not um, the cat one that we've seen in other places. This is the Lynx, and the Lynx is a completely different thing. I think this is probably the most likely thing that we're going to see because what they want to do, I think, with uh, uh, what, what CD Projekt wants to do is they want to move away from the uh, the established lore. They want to take the lore, duplicate that lore, as, as in like the universe, the world, and then they want to go to a different place that's not really in the books because they don't have this great relationship with the author the author does not like the games at all um they hate the games and and he's he's furious that they still get to continue making the games uh, mm -hmm. even though he was the one who sold them the rights for pennies on the dollar because he thought it was a stupid thing even turning down their larger offer they offered him a large part of it they offered him uh like connected to, you know a percentage of profits and each time he said no, mm -hmm. he wanted a, a smaller lump sum because he he laughed them off as being ridiculous and, and useless. So <laughs> I don't know what more we can say here as far as the author goes. He's uh, he's not somebody who you probably want to do business with in any situation. Hmm. Um, it's like a more ugly version of Stephen King and The Shining. But it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is unfortunate because again, it's it goes to show that there are there still are a lot of older generation people who look at the internet and go, "What's that? I don't care. It's stupid. It doesn't exist." In my mind, it's it's like uh, um, you know, it's like Prince. Prince refused to have his music go up on the internet because he thought it was a flash in the pan. Yep. You know, for for how many how many more decades is <laughs> like like it's it's crazy. So yeah, this is a this is a an interesting conundrum, uh, but I think they want to head away from that, you know, from from his established stuff. I think we'll see characters come back. I think we'll see Geralt and, and a bunch of the other characters come back over the time. But just looking at this, paying a little bit more attention, listening to, to people chat about it, that's what we're hearing. Um, this is probably going to be a new trilogy or more based in this new direction. Uh, I think they're going to do good with this. I think they learned their lesson. Um, from cyberpunk they didn't suddenly become bad at making games in general they just became bad at making that game you right know? they got they got bad at making the one game the one thing that you know that they they were kind of like putting all their eggs in for the for the next thing and it kind of bit them on the backside because they didn't they got rid of a lot of things that they shouldn't have gotten rid of they, they got rid of you know the rpg side of the story they got rid of you know a ton of stuff that if they just kept, you know, kept zeroed in on this stuff, basically just made a, a Witcher, you know, cyberpunk version and really focused in on that story, really focused on in on that stuff. There's lots of quests that are really interesting. There's lots of stories that are really interesting. But by trying to make this like storyfied epic through the use of a first person, I don't think that worked the way that they were wanting to, because what they ended up doing is they ended up scaling back all of the RPG mechanics. They ended up scaling back and ignoring all of the things that, that are associated with that, that you normally get that naturally demands itself, you know, present like character looks like that. That was a big thing. A lot of people complained about the character looks like they wanted to look a certain way. And that, stuff was clearly put on the back burner. You, you, you only have costumes and, and like, you know, modding, like heavy, like modding, heavy, uh, um, uh, visual, you know, uh, apparel coming in, in this latest patch. It's like, where, where was that on launch day? Like people like the way they look. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 
See, I, I threw this over to Saib at the beginning because I, I know it's sacrilegious to say, but I, I haven't really played much of The Witcher 3. I played a few hours of it. Uh, I do intend to actually give a lot of time over to it after I finish going through Fallout New Vegas, which is another huge RPG. The one thing I will say that as somebody who has played Cyberpunk 2077 is that with this new Witcher game, I, I feel pretty confident that at least with this new Witcher game, it won't be like Cyberpunk 2077 in the sense that they won't be trying to fix the bugs in the game for the next two years, mainly because they're not using the Red Engine for this game. Apparently, they're using Unreal Engine 5. Very user-friendly compared to other engines. Plus, uh, plus, plus, what am I? (laughs) What's the, Scott Weiland here? Uh, Plus, uh, Unreal Engine 5, at least the stuff that we've seen using it, looks really, really good. And they can create like realistic environments like forestry and mm-hmm. awesome creatures in Unreal Engine 5. I'm so down. So, yeah, it's obviously probably going to be like uh, at least three years away, more likely four or five. But I'm down. Uh, Witcher 3 is still widely regarded as one of the greatest games of all time. And if so if CD Projekt Red knows how to do anything, it's how to make a Witcher game. So uh, I feel pretty confident. So next uh, story, Netflix. They're still in the business of trying to uh, buy up gaming studios. It looks like they're slowly uh, edging into a long-term plan. Uh, they have now bought their third studio. Uh, let's see, what's it called again? Boss Fight Entertainment. It's a game development company formed in 2013, known mostly for making mobile games, including a game called Dungeon Boss. Uh, Yeah. So as we know, Netflix announced back in July of 2021 that it was going to be expanding into the world of gaming, bought Night School Studio, and then a second game company earlier this month called Next Games, and now they bought Boss Fight Entertainment. Mostly mobile games, which is interesting. Uh, the, the five that they have available right now aren't all that great. Like they have two Stranger Things games and then like stereotypical games that you could get on any sort of Android or iOS. Mm-hmm. Card Blast, Shooting Hoops, and Teeter Up. Oh boy. Uh, so I, does this seem like, do you think this is going to be sort of their angle for the foreseeable future uh, getting into the gaming market or do you think they'll try to go for more like triple a experiences well that would <clears throat> that would kill them uh i mean it, I, honestly it really would uh we've seen what stadia did we've seen what other mm. massive corporations have done in the past um what amazon <laughs> has tried to do their their most successful game is a game that's already been out for three years <laughs> Like after they bought it, um, <clears throat> this is this is the unfortunateness of big corporations coming in and trying to get into the arts industry, uh, because that's the, the you know arts and entertainment industry. Gaming, video games are a combination of art and entertainment. Um, sometimes a little bit of uh, uh, satanic uh, um, uh, devil worship too in the form of microtransactions. Ha, ah, gotcha. You were like, where is he going with that? Yes, microtransactions, <laughs> South Park. Look it up. It's great. Oh, sorry. South Park, Satan, and microtransaction. Look it up. It's, it's a funny meme. Anyways, um, yeah, you, you get these big corporations in who don't understand art, don't understand the concept of, of entertainment in, in a lot of cases, and they snap their fingers. They get way too many chefs into the kitchen. And they just spoil stuff. They ruin things. They, they, they're fighting over how much salt to put in the soup. And by doing so, they're dumping like, you know, a full like three or four cups in. It's like you, you guys don't know what you're doing. And so what I think they're doing is they're doing, it looks as if they're doing this smartly. And by smartly, I mean they're identifying things that they can latch on to that, that's somewhat similar or can fill um, a basic void. And they're, they're increasing slowly from there. So from my perspective, I think they're doing it right, but they may be forced into doing it right accidentally, as in they're not actually doing it smart, but because the market is so hyper competitive right now and they can't afford to throw around billions and billions of dollars, they're they're being forced to buy smaller studios when it becomes available and things that are directly tied with IP that they're connected with in some way or another. And what that is doing is that's forcing them to pace themselves, which may end up saving their keister on that. 
which is, I mean, when you think about it, it's like, wait, so, so their inability to, uh, you know, their, their, their recent problems, their recent troubles, their recent issues that they've run into with a whole mess of situations has, has actually helping them be more successful in the gaming industry or could potentially do that. It's like, yeah, doesn't that throw your brain for a loop, right? Like, isn't yeah. like, that's, that's, it's crazy that we might be looking at this situation. So if, is that for sure? Is that, you know, we, we don't really know yet. It's, this is one of these situations where we're really going to have to sit back and watch what they do. Um, <clears throat> you know, and uh, no, no, I'm not watching what they do in regards to their, uh, uh, subscription services because I, I quit that a long time ago. Right. Um, some of their movies, that that one movie they, they put out, which they got indicted for. Yeah, I saw that. Like yeah. four counts. Um, Netflix, I don't know what you're doing with your movies, but you you might want to shy away from things that will lend you in jail. Just saying. There's there's some things that we can all agree on uh, that you shouldn't do in having uh, underage girls do strip dances, probably not in the list of things that are good to do. Probably universally on the list of things not to do by pretty much everybody on the planet you know, who deserves to live to see tomorrow morning. Right. So, yeah. Aside from that idiotic uh, example of the cuties movie, uh, they aren't complete. By law, by the way, I should, I should emphasize that by law. And I'm not, I'm not saying anybody should be a vigilante. I'm just, I'm just saying that, that, you know, legally speaking, you can't have children doing strip tease dances. I mean, that's just not something that's acceptable in most of the world. I, I should preface that quite heavily. Yeah. Yeah. The still disgusting though. Oh, of course. Absolutely. I, I, aside from that though, they, they can't be complete idiots because they have been operating for a long time at a loss. And yet their brand is still very omnipresent, very recognizable. And in regards to pursuing mainly mobile games, I think you're right from a business sense. I think that given the fact that their main bread and butter is movies right now, and they're still trying to sort that out to where they can get to making profits rather than losses, uh, gradually inching into the games industry like this is probably the wisest thing. Making buyouts when it's strategically important, holding back when it's strategically important. Um, it does suck for people like you and I. We're not mobile gamers. You know, we do tend to prefer single player experiences, not necessarily AAA, maybe more indie, that sort of stuff. Um, but thankfully, th there's such a ubiquitous amount of content like that that we can get from other sources. We don't necessarily need to get it from Netflix. That said, we are talking about it just because it's interesting. Netflix is such a huge player in the entertainment industry, and we'd be curious to see how they manage to make a go of things. Maybe they'll get to a point where they can create a subscription service that model that uh, mirrors Xbox Game Pass. They'll have to, it'll probably take several years before they get there, but who knows, right? It's interesting nonetheless. Now, speaking of uh, Xbox Game Pass, uh, Phil Spencer was asked some questions in regards to that this past week. What did he say, Saeb? Do you like that transition? That was so good. Yeah, he's uh, he's basically assuring that Xbox is still going to be around. That Xbox is still uh, a primary focus of the company. Um, but I think we are seeing them like, I, I think we are seeing them kind of move away from the the emphasis on, uh, you know, being on one device. Uh, you know, they've very clearly opened up to PC you know, Windows players. And PC players, I think there, <clears throat> I think there's going to be a time that they'll probably open up to more mobile uh, things, like getting as many of their games as they can onto mobile devices. I think that's in the cards. I think that's something that they clearly have been working on for a while. But the question comes is like, well, you know, are they going to abandon Xbox? And I don't think they're smart to abandon Xbox because I, I think that 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 turns them basically into a single, you know, one one trick pony. And I don't mm. think that that is smart for them to do that. And I don't think they're intending on doing that either. I think we're going to see more things like the um, like the Xbox uh, uh, light, essentially, you know, where it streams most of the stuff. I think we're going to see more and more of that. But I think there's again, we're seeing some smart play here by them, because I think what we're seeing with with what they're doing with that aspect of things is that they're allowing the market to demand how much they ramp that up, right? 
So Google was selling its service, uh, you know, in, in its online streaming gaming platform to the richest people in the richest cities for an exorbitant cost, essentially. Like nobody who could actively like, you know, could actually want to use it were able to use it. They didn't yeah. target it to people who were low income, didn't have the greatest internet and didn't have, you know, the ability to download these massive, massive games on these very expensive things. All they've got in the house is one or two tablets at most. It's like they didn't, they could have aimed it for that. They could have come up with some te technological solutions for that. And they could have gotten in there somehow to make that work. But instead they targeted this microcosm, which I, I think it was like everybody who, like the vast majority of people who bought the Google Stadia services already had more than one Xbox, more than one PlayStation, and more than one PC in the house. <laughs> Jeez. Like, wow. So wait, hold brilliant, on. Brilliant marketing there, guys. What, what you're like, saying is that the people at Google are completely out of touch with the working class? Is that what you're saying? I, I think the leaders are. <laughs> right. <clearly. Okay. laughs> the leaders are very out of touch with like, you know, the generalized market. It's, it's why they keep screwing up so many products. You know, they, they had the Google Glass, which was a which was a great concept, but but they just kind of they just stumbled around on that. And Microsoft, I mean, they they had their own AR technology that they stumbled around on that too. And again, it's like I don't see why because there's so many things just sitting there asking for, begging for. It's like one of the one of the things that was the most requested um, uh, technology as far as like augmented reality goes is tabletop games. There's mm. a huge a huge in-demand market for tabletop VR experiences. That would be really cool. Like, if anything, and, would maybe, and yet, yeah. And you know how much money they put into this stuff? Zero. Zero. They 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 just brushed it off as if nobody wants to play D. Imagine you want to play D and D with your friends in a pandemic, right? So you can't go to each other's houses. So imagine putting on your headset and sitting around a table and having all of your other friends suddenly appear around the table and you can have a D&D &D experience while you're at the table talking with your other friends. And then you want to go and you want to play like Monopoly or or, or or some other game like that. Maybe you all want to play a game of poker, but you can't be because of the pandemic and, and it would be great to have this headset. Nobody wants that. What are you talking about? That's just stupid, duh. It's like... <laughs> It's like, do you, do you guys even hear yourselves speaking? Do you, do you even do you even listen to what you're saying? Do you have no conception of what's going on here as far as market demand goes? And they just pass this stuff by. And why do we know? Because I've been talking to some of the people that were developing tech behind this. And they pitched to these companies. And these guys looked at them and said, well, that's not really where our market analysts say that the technology and the demands are going for. Get new it's analysts. Like, it's like, get, yeah, well, I've been saying that forever. It's like, uh, you know, the 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 arrogance and the stupidity just continually amazes me as far as what these these big professionals, you know, claim to be able to do. It's just, it's truly like one of those things that is just truly like, it's just mind boggling. I just, I shake my head and I go, I go like, like, what's the point in even trying to argue with these people? So <clears throat> I think what we're seeing here is a continuing situation where phil knows what he's doing he knows what he's there to do and he knows how best to do it and a lot of that is listening to players and listening to users and then listening to what the what kind of vacuums there are in the you know for customers and filling those vacuums with a product and no i'm not talking about vacuum cleaners i'm talking about a vacuum in space yes right right <laughs> That's what I'm going. Sometimes my metaphors don't go too well. That's okay, man. I understood. So, yeah, I, I agree. Phil Spencer, especially compared to his predecessor, he's made so many really good decisions. He's he bought he brought the Xbox back from the brink of destruction with the fiasco that happened with the Xbox One. And yeah. almost 10 years later, now we have Xbox Game Pass. It's making a resurgence. It's a legitimately great alternative plus the Xbox Game Pass. And even though it's huge right now, I, I think he realizes, like you said, that it, it, who knows how long it might last for. Uh, one thing that you can always rely on is just being able to put out uh, just the games on its own, not tied to the service. And 
it, it'd be a good fallback option in case anything yeah. would ever happen. So, yeah. and I know, and I want to stress, I really want to stress this, that, that this is good for everybody in the industry. This is very good for PlayStation because Microsoft has been keeping PlayStation on its toes for the most part. You know, PlayStation has been really doing some messy things with censorship and some other stuff. And, yep. and I am very worried for, um, for everybody who plays PlayStation because I, I fear them waking up one morning and, you know, having a disaster like what happened with the Xbox One suddenly sitting on their 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 lap, but they can't really do anything about it. Like, I, I really, I genuinely am concerned about that because I know how hard it is. You know, people made a decision with their console and, and or their products and stuff like that, and they don't have the ability to just switch or, or jump from one thing to the next on a daily basis. Yeah. So I, I completely understand, and I and I and I really want to encourage, and I really want to, um, you know, tell people it's like when when Xbox does good, that makes the other consoles do good too. Because, you know, when you're in an environment of competition and your competitors are really healthy, you know that that's a good thing for you because that's going to keep you on your toes. It's going to force you to you know to perform better because of good competition. If you didn't have good competition, then customer service would become a less and less, you know, demanding thing because, well, you're the only show in town, right? Right. So, you know, so yeah. Yeah. You know, you're doing a good job when you can make the same people who said, oh, we don't think Xbox Game Pass is sustainable, change their mind a couple of years later. And allegedly, it's rumored they're coming out with their own subscription model sometime in the next year or two. Uh, talk about PlayStation here. So yeah, good for Phil Spencer. Uh, moving on to uh, something else from Sony, though. Uh, Gran Turismo 7. People have been losing their minds about this game. I, I, I've i only been paying attention to it just because of the drama surrounding it. I'm, I'm not a really big fan of racing games. I think the last racing game that I played intensely was Need for Speed Most Wanted, and that came out in 2005. So yeah, but you know, more power to those who enjoy it. Um, unfortunately, though, a lot of people who have been playing Gran Turismo 7, which came out recently for the PlayStation 5, have been having a lot of issues. So I'm going to detail some of those right now. Gran Turismo 7 apparently is a pretty damn good driving simulator. Like, it's a well-made game. But unfortunately, one's ability to enjoy the simulative aspects of the game are hampered by terrible business practices from the people behind the game. So check out, check this out. Back on March 17th, so that was about eight days ago from the time we were recording this podcast, Gran Turismo released uh, Update 1.07 for their game, which brought about just a slew of technical problems and quality of life problems. One thing about the update was that it caused multiplayer to go offline for more than 24 hours, which is very unusual in this day and age for that sort of thing to happen. Uh, But the other... That's just actually a tangential problem compared to the big problem, which is that this update made the number of in-game credits awarded to you for certain events, it lowered it, which really pissed off a lot of people. It sort of reminds people of uh, some of the things that happened during the Anthem days when people were like, no, 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 this was fine. Like the, the progression was fine, and then they just made it more difficult. Or am I thinking of Avengers? Or maybe it's both. I can't remember. But anyways, the Grand Avengers. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was Avengers. I just can't remember if it was Anthem too. Uh, also, also Assassin's Creed, uh, one, the the newer one. Oh, really? Valhalla, I... Yeah. Where it's like, hey, you need one million of these resources to do this special thing, but don't worry, you get a hundred thousand every time you do this thing. And everybody's like, oh, cool. This is you know ten times. It's fine. And then you know, nice patch rolls out. Well, actually, rewards have been lowered to seventy five thousand for that thing. It's like okay, okay. Well, I guess I got to do a lot more of that. Oh, now it's lowered to twenty five thousand. But hey, don't worry. You can now buy packets of two hundred thousand of these resources that you need to do the thing to unlock the thing to get access to the thing. That's cool. And it's like, and and they keep doing that. And Gran Turismo is is another great example where it's like. Hey, it's now harder to do something unless you're willing to give us some money. Right. And check out. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the producer's justification for this mm-hmm. change. And this is going to make something. you laugh. Yeah, because it, it made me just howl and then cry simultaneously. I didn't think that was possible. 
So uh, his name is Kazunori Yamauchi, the, the producer for Gran Turismo 7. He addressed the lowering of in-game credits uh, awarded to you, as well as the inclusion of microtransactions in the game uh, during a recent interview. He said, quote, Some event rewards have been adjusted. I want to also explain the reasons for it and our plans going forward. In Gran Turismo 7, I would like to have you users enjoy lots of cars and races, even without microtransactions. Sounds good, right? At the same time, the pricing of cars is an important element that conveys their value and rarity, so I do think it's important for it to be linked with real-world prices. I want to make GT7 a game in which you can enjoy a variety of cars in lots of different ways. If possible, I would like to try and avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep... <laughs> Sorry, I, I, oh, I, I forgive me. I'll, I'll read that again. If possible, I would like to try to avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep replaying certain events repeatedly. End quote. Really? Well, this doesn't seem to appear to be the case because the lowering of credit rewards and tying the prices of the cars to real life prices makes a player have to mechanically replay certain events. Thank you very much. And look, even to those who are willing to do that, there's the added issue of the fact that this is the first time in Gran Turismo history that you have to have a constant online connection in order to play mm -hmm. the damn game. So there's that added hurdle. Now, just one other thing before I sort of throw this back over to side. In case you don't, like, still aren't really appreciating how bad the situation is for the microtransactions and the progression in this game. At the moment, Gran Turismo 7 has four options when it comes to purchasing credits. You can get 100000 for 249 American, and this is all in American dollars. 250,000 credits for 499 750,000 for 999 and two million for nineteen ninety nine, and many of the cars, if not most of them, cost between seven hundred fifty thousand and two million in the game. So it seems like they are pushing the gamer to spend more. Mm -hmm. This, plus the always online component and the multiplayer issues, have caused user ratings on Metacritic to drop to the lowest score for any PS five game. People yep. are pissed and. It just doesn't seem like any of the people behind these games that are putting like this grind and the microtransactions into them seem to learn. And I think I understand why. It's because people who play them, there's that one contingent of the gaming population, like 5 to 10% of people that have money and can just pump it in and the, the game companies are able to just live off of that while screwing over 90% of their consumer base. And they never learn because they go for the short-term gain but we'll inevitably deal with the long-term pain. Right, mm -hmm. side. Yeah. Well, and 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 you, you nailed it with the how they do their microtransactions. It's like, <clears throat> hi, here's a pack. We, we're selling this really cool thing. It's worth 15 crystallized mushrooms. And you're like, well, okay, well, how many does fit? How, how can I buy or how can I get the 15 crystallized mushrooms? They're like, oh, well, we sell them in packs of 10. It's like, great. So I have to buy... 20 of them in order to buy the thing for 15. Why, yes. And then we have a little bonus thing here for seven crystallized mushrooms. So I'd have to buy another 10. Yes, that's right. And and they just lead you on that path where it, it's, I mean, it's everything from the crystals to the way that the opening of the crystals works to everything is just one one step after another drives you down further and further and further into the into the microtransaction hellhole that's there. And and I got to say that that um you know as fun as Lost Ark has been, it the the microtransaction thingy is getting on my nerves. I have only bought costumes so far because I like costumes and and I've always felt that costumes are fair. Yeah, if it's a know, free to play because, game, go ahead. <laughs> well, especially if it's a free to play game, but I mean even in even in other games like, you know, Skyrim and stuff. It's like I want them to continue to add content to it, and I understand that you can't you can't talk a board or whatever into allowing you to to put a team of people to work on costumes. Where it's like, well, how many people do do you think are going to buy these costumes? 
and it's like, or, or want these costumes, and you're like two percent, and they're like, oh, that's not acceptable. We want, we want more for our money. Don't you understand? And so they say, well, okay, well, what if, what if we charged money for these outfits, and then suddenly it becomes profitable because even if only two percent of your population base is buying those particular costumes, you know that still is there. And then what that ends up doing is that ends up keeping an uh, uh, keeping your a staff section, a team of yours on making better and better costumes, which end up helping the game further and further down the line. It's actually a, a good thing for, for, um, you know, for long, the long term of a gaming company or health is to have a teams that continue to improve on their art. And you can't really do that. If you just make the product once and then throw everything out, you start over from scratch. So now, and, and again, in a perfect world, we have, you know, excellent DLCs that are offer us great story. Then we have excellent products that that are rewarded, you know, by just a straight up transaction, and then that can get muddied by having this microtransaction hellhole start, where you just keep getting further and further into the mud, and and sooner or later you're suddenly you know hiring on a psychologist to help you find ways to make people spend more money. Yeah, and that's just that's so dirty. It's so dirty. I miss the days when like games it would just come out like the game would be done and then you pay for dlc and that the biggest controversy of the day was selling horse armor and oblivion that was sort of like the seeds of where we are right now and, I, and, and you gotta you gotta you gotta hate the um you gotta hate the analysts there oh yeah on that one because they were originally they were originally going to sell the horse armor for 50 cents because they they did the math and that was a good return on their money and Suddenly, these analysts showed up and started screaming at them, going, "No, no, 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 no! You have to charge eight dollars for that, sir. You can't, you can't let these these plebs have something for for almost nothing for pocket change." <laughs> and it's like, it's like those are the people that I wish. Again, I'm going to skirt the law on this one. I wish that that they. Um, met some untimely demise completely through legal and normal means, like maybe a meteorite coming out of the sky. <laughs> you know, something that we could say, oh, act of God, instead of, you know, obviously don't, don't right. go after these people. But still, it's just, it's so annoying to continually see these really evil, evil, just, I mean, and that's what this is. Like, like when you hire, hire a psychologist to find out how to manipulate your players to spend more money, and to get them hooked onto the microtransaction thing so that they could continue to spend money on your platform. When you do that, when you employ people who are like, hello, sir, we're hiring for a position. Uh, what are your credentials? Well, here are my credentials. I studied in, in uh, a sorrow, depravity, and evilness academy for five years. Oh, and do you have any references? Yes, Satan and a couple of uh, uh, World War II people who are now deceased who were, you know, running the, the axis of evil. Right. Oh, wonderful. We'll hire you. Wait, stop. Maybe you're doing something wrong. Like. But money. Like, <laughs> but money. Again, I, I keep thinking, I keep coming back to that uh, South Park episode because it was, it was so good. It's like, it's like the devil is sitting there trying to convince these people how, how to like, how to to rip money off that uh, Terrence and, and Philip. They're trying to convince Terrence and Philip how to like, you know, just to be absolutely devilish. And at, at no point is it is like like uh, we apparently a bunch of these CEOs saw that and decided, hey, that's a great tutorial. That that's a great TED talk right there. I, I'm gonna learn how to do this. I'm gonna hire people to to f help me figure out how much money we can pull away from our fans disgusting mm. Mm. I, I agree with you Saib. I, I just want to sort of elaborate on why i agree with you uh, by just adding this one other thing i do understand sort of bringing market analysts in to sort of make your product appeal more to people but when it's at the expense of the consumer and you're engaging in predatory practices to sort of gouge the most money out of your consumer then that's not okay that's evil like you say we i i I could use a different metaphor. I hope uh, they meet death by the guardians to, to use a halo reference. 
By the way, we're not, I haven't seen the Halo TV show yet. We're not going to talk about that. Um, maybe I'll see it sometime this week. I just haven't been hearing it's, good things. You've been hearing good things or haven't been hearing Have good not. Things? Yeah. Yeah, that's, sounds about uh, right. That's like every major show that I was excited for the last like year and a half. Of, it's like, they're all an extreme disappointment. Mm. Have you seen The Wheel of Time? I have not. That's, okay. that's another one that I heard too many bad things on. And I was just like, okay, all right. I, I made the mistake of watching the first couple of episodes of, of Picard and just being, I have been absolutely, um, just, it's been, it's been abysmal. It yeah. It's been abysmal. I, I, it's, you know, I remember this one scene where Picard stands up to Starfleet and gives them, crap because they want to take data's child away from them because they want to figure out how to create ai soldiers and and artificial soldiers that they could just pump out like crazy and you know ignoring the fact that this is a sentient life form and picard tells them to you know basically screw themselves and then and then you have like you you realize that the the latest show if that situation had happened again Picard would say, oh, no, uh, Data, you have to give your child to the state. I mean, really, when you think about it, it's the best uh, It's the best uh, chance for them to grow is, uh, is away from your parental care. In fact, it's, uh, you know, it's probably even, you know, you might be a criminal if you don't agree with everything the state says. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. It's just, I, I, it's just really disappointing. Yeah, I know. I, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Black Pencil Ninja, he's been on the show before. He loves Picard as well, and he shares the exact sentiments that apparently it's sort of a postmodernist imagining of Picard, and he goes against the character he was in Next Generation. So that's he goes bad. against he goes against so much, and, and I mean, Q goes against everything. Everything is terrible. Damn. Ugh. Well, but I will oh. say though, I like. I did watch the entire first season of The Wheel of Time. While the first episode is a little bit finicky in the way that it's structured, it actually gets really, really good. So uh, hopefully that will take away from uh, your personal woes of so much crap coming out. Um, Speaking of things that uh, I hope aren't crap, we've known that for a while there's going to be a Metal Gear Solid movie. This is obviously very important to me. Metal Gear Solid is my all-time favorite uh, entertainment franchise and i've been watching closely for any news that were come out of this movie the last thing that we heard uh recently was that oscar isaac the guy who played poe dameron in the star wars movies he's going to be playing moon knight very soon for marvel he was cast to play solid snake i'm on record i think that's a very good casting choice I am still a bit weary as to whether or not he can pull off the physicality of Solid Snake, but in terms of the character itself, I think he can nail it. Absolutely. Uh, But aside from that, we haven't really heard much information until this past week when at an event for the aforementioned Moon Knight, Oscar Isaac was asked about the development of the Metal Gear Solid movie um, by IGN uh, at a red carpet premiere. And this is what Oscar had to say. I'm quoting. We're searching... We're searching like Solid Snake. We're climbing through air ducts. We're looking for the story. And that's all he said. Uh, this, some people don't really know what to make of this. This is a bit weird to me because from what I understood, the script for this movie was already done. Like the, Jordan Vogt Roberts, the guy who's been tapped to direct the Metal Gear Solid movie, he had the guy uh, who wrote Jurassic World and a couple other movies he had him come on to write the script. So I don't know why he's saying that they're looking for the story. Um, I sort of chalked this up to Oscar Isaac not really being so much in the know as the director and the writer are. Uh, I also think that because things have sort of stalled in production that Oscar Isaac doesn't really know that much. And plus, when he was asked the question, it sort of seemed like he was rushing uh, off to talk to somebody else. So mm-hmm. that's why I don't really put too much thought into it but i just figured i mentioned it just because it's related to i will i will <clears throat> i have a quick answer for this don't worry yeah he is doing what charlie sheen and a lot of other actors have done in the past which is called descriptive explanations and in which they say something that they don't actually mean what you could literally take it down to mean like for example i have 
what did was what was it tiger blood or something like that <laughs> yeah i have tiger blood in my veins that that's By not winning. saying that's not saying that he literally has tiger blood in his veins which i heard some people ask it's like is he putting actual tiger blood in his system i think i read an art i think i remember an article where somebody was like that's very unhealthy or maybe it was just an idiot news person on a tv um don't worry about this. These these are when actors say flowery things, they're not always saying something that's necessarily should be translated into something real. He might have been what he might have been referencing, most likely, I would say, is that he was referencing the time to film the movie. Not necessarily to write or line up a director or anything like that. I think a lot of that stuff has already been done because they they typically don't cast somebody for that role until they're like really set on you know that it's going to actually go through right yeah i mean so it, I, it does happen sometimes like there have been mm-hmm. people like i think what, what was the name of the the actress the one that dated robert rodriguez who was tapped to play red sonia uh and then that never happened and tom hardy he was actually tapped to play sam fisher in a splinter cell mm-hmm. movie and that never happened but yeah, you're right. Like they have done quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, those th- those things happen all the time too. Like obviously, but in this particular case, I I would say that that I kind of doubt that they're gonna like pull back on that because it is that movie is like it's like if you do it if you do it even moderately okay, like moderately okay, not not moderately good, not moderately fantastic, just moderately okay, you will basically print money with the movie. <laughs> And it's one of those things where it's like, if they just do this stuff right, it'll be so good. But as we just said, sometimes even that's a bit of a stretch because people just can't, they can't help themselves in ruining things for other people. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, Uh, annoying. I'm still, yeah, like you, I'm I'm not worried. Uh, The guy that they brought on to direct, I still have all faith in him. Like, if you're a Metal Gear Solid fan like I am and you've listened to mm-hmm. him talk, I'm talking about Jordan Volt Roberts. I can't imagine anybody else being more capable of bringing us a, a good Metal Gear Solid film. Hell, even Hideo Kojima endorsed him, so there you go. Anyways, that's all the gaming-related news that we had this week, but we did want to sort of finish on something that Saib and I felt to be quite important because there is an app that gamers tend to use quite frequently called Discord. I use it for my community. Uh, the Triple S League has used it for theirs, but there's been some problems going on as of late with their changes in terms of service, and we thought we'd talk about that just so you guys are all aware. So, Saib, do you want to take sort of explain what's been going on with that? Yeah, so we we made the announcement today. Um, this weekend, we're going to be uh, we're going to be cutting away and removing certain sections of our Discord. Uh, we're going to be deleting everything in in certain sections. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of, uh, clear for, for existing content, which really sucks because it's, that stuff's been there for years and you literally go back in years and see some really great discussions and, and stuff and content. Um, <clears throat> but frankly, we, we no longer feel safe with discord. We, we certainly don't feel safe with discord when we're having discussions about sensitive topics and when we're having discussions around, um, or, or sharing memes. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. I grew up in a day and age where my grandfather had, um, didn't have very many comics around the place, didn't have very much comedy, but what he did have as, as a lowly farmer working the land um, is that he had a, uh, a collection of political cartoons, making fun of political people that, that, you know, he both respected and didn't like at the same time. And that always stuck with me because it always made, it always became clear that making fun of people in power is a good thing. It helps keep them in check. It, it helps them to prevent to becoming tyrants. And when you have that removed, when you have the, when you remove comedy from the social discourse, you get, you get bad things. Absolutely. I mean, you get really bad things. And one of the, some of the first people to go in every tyrant uh, tyrant regime that starts up, some of the very first people to go officially, like, you know, not not before the political, you know, uh, if, if there's political violence that results in this happening, it's the people after the new 
the new regime is set is comedians. Comedians almost always get executed uh, in large numbers. And I remember that uh, one of my most favorite comedians, Victor Borga, ran away from his his uh, country of birth because of this. Um, there were many others. Uh, history has a long record of comedians being killed because they mocked the wrong person at the wrong point in time. And I think that that comedy and I think that discussion is something that you can't always be safe with because sometimes people have a really, really, really terrible, you know, name it, presupposition, assumption, uh, uh, some form of bigotry. Sometimes they're just, you know, ignorant on things. And the way that you get away from this stuff and the way that you set the record straight is you have discussion on it. Well, you can't, you can't, when you're having a discussion on, on a sensitive topic, you actually have to talk about the sensitive topic. You can't just throw it, you know, in the lawnmower and say, we're never going to mention that. So like, you're not going to get the answers. You're not going to have the conversation. You're not going to be able to put sunlight on a bad idea, which is the best disinfectant. You're not going to be able to remove the, the bad concepts without discussing and having discourse. Which is funny because this whole thing's called discord. So we want, we're, we're pulling some stuff back. We've set up a new gilded server. Uh, we're not giving up on on Discord entirely. There's lots of people who who you know still rely on it to be their main source of of connection with us. So, but we are going to be gradually. We have now have a backup. Um, there'll be a link in the description for our new Discord, uh, sorry, gilded uh, Discord Discord area. It's very similar to Discord. It's almost identical. We have uh, we've copied over everything basically you know, have it identical. There's already members over there. So please join up over there. Please jump in, in the, in the actual discourse on Gilded. Um, and yeah, the, the, the ability for people to speak their mind and then to have, you know, actual conversation is important. And we want to, to have that. Uh, one of the things that we'll be putting up is, I, I don't know if you ever heard it, Max, but uh, Rona Atkinson did a speech about free speech. Yes, I saw that. And, yeah. and and what it meant to him. We'll be replacing the the um some of our more spicier topic channels with a, a monument um to to the former place to have discussions on these things and to communicate. And just so that everybody understands, some people are like, Well, you know, Discord's just getting rid of all the prawn and the sandwich making and the sandwich making is our code word for <clears throat> the other thing that you yeah. find on Hob. Um we don't we don't allow that stuff anyways because we're more or less a family channel. Uh, we already have pretty stringent records, uh, or sorry, not records. We have pretty stringent stringent oh my goodness um, rules when it comes to what you can and can't post, and we do that because we want you know it to be generally PG. We want you know uh, Ash has kids and 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 there are you know there are kids on on that show up on the Discord via their parents who are members and and stuff like that from time to time. And we we don't want to allow them to accidentally click on a link that takes them to, you know, some some three way sandwich making, if you catch my drift. Uh, so we have we have rules against that stuff. Um, and we we don't we don't allow you know, we don't we don't have a section that's dedicated to, you know, Alex Jones or anything like that. We just have general places where people talk about issues and they talk through some issues. And with this war going on right now, um, and there's been some pretty heated topics on this stuff. But what we've had and what we've developed over the last few years is the ability to discuss and talk about these things and have some level of of hammering out ideas, hammering out concepts, and ha- and, and the ability to try and correct people when they're wrong and, and gracefully, you know, and to to encourage people to, you know, see past their differences. I thought this was an important thing. But yeah. apparently this is not an important thing to certain megacorps who decide that it's either their way or the highway. And you don't get to experiment. You don't get to come to a place where you understand that point of view. You have to arrive at that point of view before you start to use their services. And if you don't, you're just, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're the a worst thing person. that a terrible person. And, and it's so, it's so wrong because it's so deceptive and it's so evil. Yeah. And and we really we really want to um, encourage people to move away from it. Uh, we don't we don't abandon we don't abandon places. 
um, where you know where we're set up. Uh, we we on want, a whim, yeah. You know, on a whim, we we we're not shutting down Discord Discord tomorrow, but we're certainly not you know we're certainly not using them as a as a financial investment anymore. We're not using them as as other things. Instead, we'll be shifting away that kind of stuff um, into other places, and and we're going to be pushing to do other things. It's the same thing. It's the same reason why we, we set up a subscribe star. It's the same reason why we're, we're probably going to end up setting up a locals. It's like, <clears throat> it's like we, we need the ability. People need the ability to speak, to be understood, to have some conversation back and forth, and then to come to a point where they can understand what's going on. If we don't have that, we don't have discourse. You have a, a they have discord. You 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 have you have Discord via a state uh, or or a, a corporation approval board. It's like that. That's not good. Like it it really isn't. It's like, do you want some places like that every now and then? Sure, you know you don't want everywhere to be a a, a um, clothing optional. You know, uh, um, paint whatever you want on the walls environment sometimes you want an environment that's a little bit more you know controlled and and that's fine but you don't ever want to go down fully and have just one thing all the time because you either get tyranny or you know mad max universe Mm -hmm. it's like you you want to have you want to have a little bit of the two things and and discord i like they they could have just the easiest solution i think that they could have done was just have warnings for servers and set up, you know, servers that, you know, are, are, you know, adult, you know, enter at your own risk essentially, and then just have a verification system. Like that's, that's literally all it would take. This is just like, are you sure you want to join the server? It it has, it has uh, some, some spicy memes in it from time to time. And again, it's like, I'm not, I'm not advocating for, for, um, for places where there, you could share anything that's illegal. I I don't think that the, I, nothing illegal that's you know illegal in a normalized country that has you know an emphasis on on personal liberty. I don't think anything illegal that's illegal there should be legal on the internet just willy nilly. I, I think that that there's there's definitely rules for that, and and I'm insinuating one particular thing. If you catch my drift, you know, not insinuating like you know other stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm specifically targeting one thing that is a problem on discord but at the same time it's like there has been discord communities that have been trying to like help discord with this stuff and they just ignore them and and worse yet sometimes they just attack them outright and again that doesn't make any sense because that doesn't fix the problem that just you know moves it so anyways a bit of a long spiel um please join our gilded uh look for us on on other social media platforms and um, yeah, just uh, if you're if you're wondering why uh, on Monday, if suddenly you lose a ton of your Discord servers, that's why. And perhaps it's a good time to join Gilded, anyways. Yeah, I I talked about this briefly, like the change in the terms of service with one of my moderators the other day. Um, I didn't like because of sort of the generally civil nature of my community. I didn't really think about it too much uh but i think i'm gonna sort of do what you've done just just in case i'll probably set up a gilded server let everybody know about it and mm-hmm. then if all hell breaks loose then we'll just revert back to that you may get a warning you may they may just automatically remove certain things they may start to put you on a list and then cancel you at their leisure and we've had we've had a large community that were friends with us uh go offline in a day and Jeez. Discord never showed the evidence for why they killed killed that server and killed that community. They never ever exposed the information that they said was on there. They said, "Well, you know, a certain big major cor- corporation told us it was there, so we just deleted it all, mm-hmm. and then blacklisted every single person on the community." <sighs> yeah. Well, with that said, uh, in case you guys don't know, the leader of the People's Republic of China. Looks like Winnie the Pooh. All right. Um, that does it for this edition of Maximum News. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Make sure to hit that like button. It's free, easy to do, and helps us out a lot. Make sure to leave a comment down below if you have anything to say about any of the stuff that we talked about today. Saib, thank you as always for your lovely insight and for doing this podcast with me. You just remind people about the other channel before we tune out for the night. 
Indeedy. Uh, check us out on the Triple S League on YouTube and Triple uh, S Podcast is, is the places you're listening to us now. Although we're probably going to clip this and put this also on the, the main channel. Yeah. And you guys could just find me, uh, Max Derrett, just on all the various forms of media, uh, social media, just at my name, Max Derrett. We'll put links to all that in the description box below. Thanks, guys. And until we do this again next week, uh, next week I'll be back in Canada and there'll be less noise in the background, I promise. I want to remind you, as always, and as per usual, y'all stay yellow.